uh, we will be able to see you on YouTube as well. I've got that running on the side. So um, thanks for bearing with us. It's, it's an adventure in technology. So. My pleasure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm watching it on a 20 second delay. Looks like everything's good. So we'll begin here and it will be uh, streaming out to everyone else as well. So, okay. So with that friends, uh, let me offer just a brief introduction and we'll get right into our uh, lecture and conversation. Uh, first, just a word of welcome. My name is Jeremy Rutledge and I'm the senior pastor at Circular Congregational Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And it's my delight to welcome you back to our spring lectures in theology and ethics with Professor Viet Thanh Nguyen. Uh, as we begin, I would like to thank uh, Catherine Cullinan and Tyler Ung for working behind the scenes to make this possible and working this evening to make this possible. I'd like to thank the Circular Church Endowment uh, for underwriting these lectures so that they could be free and open to all. And I'd like to thank each of you for joining us for this important conversation. Uh, a quick word on our format. This will be similar to last evening. Uh, Viet will offer us a lecture. And sorry, I'm getting a message about the, the technical bits. Um, I think it's working. So the format will be a, a brief lecture, then we'll have some time for conversation, and then we'll invite some guests uh, for Q&A, and then also have questions from the larger group. Feel free to enter your questions into the comments at any time, and we'll do our best uh, to get through as many as we can. Um, so the brief introduction would be this. Professor Viet Thanh Nguyen teaches at the University of Southern California. He's a MacArthur Fellow, and after last night's presentation, based on all the texts and emails I received, I can confidently say he's one of our most popular lecturers. Uh, we were delighted and um, challenged to hear last evening's lecture, Being Asian American in a Time of Anti-Asian Violence, and we look forward this evening to continuing that rich conversation uh, with a presentation on an ethics of recognition. So. Uh, Fiat, we're so glad that you're back with us, and let me turn it over to you uh, now. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Uh, and like I said, I'm doing this without being able to see anybody. So if you need to get my attention, please say something. That's the only way I'll be able to find out what's going on. But uh, everybody, thanks so much for, for being here today or coming back if you were there uh, yesterday. And you know, yesterday what I was talking about, um, besides this topic of being Asian American in a time of violence, was this claim that I was making that uh, claiming Americanness for Asian Americans has some advantages and some problems. And today I want to address a different issue, which is something I brought up um, yesterday as well, and I was going to elaborate on today. And that is this idea that Asian Americans and other people of color and other minorities, however you choose to define them, not just racially, populations like these have often tried to prove their humanity as a way of belonging to this country. And the argument I want to make is that proving humanity is itself a problem. And it's going to be related to my idea about what constitutes an ethical form of memory. And I want to start with my own memories, my own, my own origins, um, which began when I became a refugee. And I still call myself a refugee, which can seem kind of odd, because as might be apparent, I've long ago made the transition from refugee to bourgeoisie from camps to clubs. But my first memories began in a refugee camp. And what happened is that myself, along with 130,000 other Vietnamese people, fled from Vietnam in 1975 on the anniversary of this day, actually, April 30th, because we happened to be on the losing side of that particular war. And we ended up in the United States in one of four uh, refugee camps. Mine happened to be Fort Indian Town Gap in Pennsylvania. And in order to leave, one of these camps. You had to have an American to sponsor you. In my family's case, there was nobody willing to sponsor all four of us. So one sponsor took my parents, one sponsor took my 10-year-old brother, and one sponsor took four-year-old me. And this is where my memories begin, howling and screaming as I'm taken away from my parents. Now, this was being done for our own good, <laughs> to allow my parents the time to get on their own two feet. But of course, when you're four years old, you don't understand 
that that is what is happening. So I experienced that as an abandonment. And it was a very painful experience. And I, uh, I think I've, I've spent much of my life trying to put that behind me and thinking that I did, but I think it remained with me forever, stamped between my shoulders like an invisible stamp. And a few years ago, uh, my own son turned four years old, and this was around the time of the so-called Muslim ban. And this was the occasion for me to look at him and see me and to reflect back on something that I had tried to forget, what that experience might have been like for four-year-old me. But what was also different is that now I was a father and I could finally see my parents in that situation, something that I'd never thought about before as self-centered as I am. What did my parents feel when their children were taken away from them? And thinking of myself as a parent, thinking of my own son, I, th I thought there would be no circumstance in which I could imagine that I would allow my children to be separated from me. I couldn't imagine how painful that experience was. So thinking about our country's stance on refugees, on immigrants coming from outside of this country and coming from south of the border into this country. And, and of course, during the last few years, and even to this day, we see families being detained at our border, families being separated, children being separated, being put into detention camps, being lost in the bureaucratic system for months or years or indefinitely as the case might be. I know that this experience will be forever traumatic and scarring for these children and their parents. And that is an experience. I mean, we call these people coming from the South, for example, into our border, across our border, uh, illegal aliens, if we're being uncharitable, undocumented migrants, if we're being charitable, but we don't call them refugees. But I think they are refugees. And of course, this is a matter of classification and so on. And, and I'm going to talk about that. But in my case, you know, I was lucky compared to uh, these children and these families um, coming from south of the border because I got to go home after a few months. My brother, who was two years old, didn't get to come home for two years. And that, he likes to say, is how we know mom and dad love you more. You don't feel too sorry for him, though, because seven years after coming to this country with no English, he did graduate as valedictorian of his high school and went to Harvard University, which is apparently what you're supposed to do when you're Asian. So I call myself a refugee and not an immigrant because I think the distinction exists and is crucial to point out. Now, when you go to the United Nations High Commission on Refugees website, UNHCR, what you discover is that the population of people who are classified in this way as refugees and so on has grown tremendously in the last few years. According to UNHCR in 2016, when I first started checking these figures, there were 66 million displaced people in the world. Now, the last time I checked a couple months ago, 79.5 million displaced people in the world. And of this, officially 26 million are classified as refugees, meaning people who are, are forced to move from one country to another. By that definition, I was certainly a refugee and so were my parents. And coming to this country, it was a classification that I didn't spend too much time thinking about, but I think myself and many other people, in fact, do have some intuitive sense of what refugees are. And generally that perception is negative. That to be a refugee in this country and probably in other countries is to be stigmatized. And I, I have a very, you know, some examples about how intuitive that feeling is. I know, for example, at a cocktail party, I should not say that I'm a refugee because there's probably no quicker way to kill a cocktail party conversation. Americans just have no idea what to make out of that experience. Now, if you tell an American in a cocktail party that you're an immigrant, the reception in many places, not all cocktail parties, but in many cocktail parties probably will be a positive one. Welcome to our country or tell us about the colorful country you came from and what obstacles we know you must have overcome to achieve the American dream. Refugee, different experience. I went to a, a, a high school in Boise a couple of years ago to give a talk to refugee students, to a refugee program. So I thought I would start off with an easy question and ask them, how many of you are refugees? Almost nobody raised their hands. Now these teenagers who had been in this country a year or two or three years had somehow 
understood that there was something wrong with being a refugee. Because when I asked how many of you are immigrants, then they started to raise their hands. Now, these Vietnamese refugees who came with me in 1975, some of them ended up in Louisiana. And 30 years later, Hurricane Katrina happened, displaced tens of thousands of people. And some in the media called these people refugees. And President George Bush at the time said, it's un-American to call these people refugees. Now, a lot of them also happened to be black. And for perhaps the only time in history, Jesse Jackson agreed with George Bush and said that it is racist to call African American people refugees. So I thought, great. We refugees have succeeded in bringing America together in hating us. So there's a huge incentive for people who are refugees not to call themselves refugees and to mask themselves as immigrants, which is why I think it's so important, so urgent for those of us who are refugees like myself to identify ourselves as such and to stand up so that we can be counted among the refugees and to express solidarity with the unwanted. And I've always wanted to embrace this refugee experience. I certainly embraced it intuitively, intuitively without knowing uh, the word for it. Uh, but knowing the word for it and the concept behind it and the history behind it makes me to want to embrace it even more. Not all Vietnamese refugees, however, feel the same way. Now we, this, we still have these uh, uh, populations coming to our doors, our borders, asking to be let in. And there are some former Vietnamese refugees who say, don't let them in. Because we were the good refugees and these people are the bad refugees. Well, I grew up in the Vietnamese refugee community of San Jose, California in the 1970s and 1980s. And let me tell you something, there were a lot of bad Vietnamese refugees. We did it all. Cash under the table economies, welfare fraud, insurance scams. We were so bad, we invented a crime that the San Jose Police Department had to come up with a new name for, the home invasion where young Vietnamese gangsters would break into Vietnamese homes hunting for cash and gold. So we were not the good refugees. We were the lucky refugees. You have to remember that in 1975, the majority of Americans did not want to admit refugees from Southeast Asia, but through an act of Congress, because Congress was probably feeling guilty a little bit about the war in Southeast Asia and because Congress recognized that it was good politics to let in refugees fleeing from newly communist countries, we were allowed in. So we were lucky. And to even use this language of good and bad refugees and the corollary good and bad immigrants is really problematic because it raises certain kinds of questions. What makes someone a bad refugee or a bad immigrant. Now, all, these, all those Vietnamese refugees that I know who, who you know, skirted the law or outright broke it and committed cr violent crimes, yes, that was wrong. But what made them do these things? Was it possibly because they came from a war-torn country where people had to be corrupt, had to cheat the system in order to survive? Was it possibly because the young boys and men who committed these violent acts had uncles and brothers and fathers who were soldiers who had been deeply traumatized by a very violent war. And what makes someone a good refugee or a good immigrant? My brother became a doctor. I became a writer and a professor. Uh, There's so many doctors and lawyers and engineers and out there, all noble occupations. They've done good for themselves and for their families, but what good are they doing outside of that? So I can't help but feel that the language of the good refugee, the good immigrant is a test of acceptability. You know, that, that, that really means what we want as a country, if we use this kind of idea, this terminology, what we want are only the exceptional refugees and the exceptional immigrants. But we can't base our immigration and refugee policy just on people who might become Pulitzer Prize winners. Now, I for one believe in an America that is equal for all, in which refugees and immigrants have the right to be mediocre, just like every other American. So I, I you know, over the course of, the, you know, yesterday and today, maybe I've been giving you the impression that, you know, being a refugee is a really terrible experience. Um, it is, generally speaking, but it's not all bad. And being a refugee has given me the 
the requisite emotional damage necessary to become a writer. And I've done my best to pass on that damage to my son. So like many other little boys, he likes Legos. He's always asking for Legos all the time. And you know, if you're a parent, that you shouldn't say yes. So sometimes I have to say no. And I say, no, you're not going to get these Legos. And I ask him, do you know why you're not going to get these Legos? You don't think about it for a moment. And I'll say, because you're a refugee. And I say, absolutely right. I want him to know empathy for refugees. I want him to know that his parents and all of his grandparents are refugees. And that gets us to the subject of memory. When should we remember and how should we remember? An ethical question. And I want him to remember because these are his people, his parents, his grandparents, his cousins, his extended family, and so on. And I call this kind of memory an ethics of remembering our own. That is, it is ethical for us to remember people who are like us, people who are part of our family, people who are part of our community, people who are part of our nation. And so it's crucial for refugees to remember other refugees and immigrants. Now, the complication of this ethics of remembering our own is that it has some other purposes. Because if we were to talk about the former president, and I find it hard, honestly, to say, to use the word ethical with our former president, but he did express a form of ethical memory that is the ethics of remembering our own. By putting America first, by saying during his inauguration speech, you will never be forgotten again. Of course, he didn't mean me, but he meant a different kind of you. But nevertheless, he was reaching out and expressing that version of ethical memory that is arguably a white nationalist form of ethical memory. So many different communities can engage in this ethics of remembering our own. And it, unfortunately, the ethics are sometimes, oftentimes, inevitably, find themselves with a corollary of forgetting others. So what's the next step after that? I went from an ethics of remembering our own, that is remembering myself as a refugee, remembering other Vietnamese refugees, to embracing other refugees who are not like me. And I call this model of ethical memory, the ethics of remembering others, whereby we extend our sense of kinship from our own to others. And I think we really have to remember here that what we consider to be natural is oftentimes highly constructed because what is natural about remembering people who are also Americans? We will never encounter most Americans in our lives, but somehow we feel them to be a part of our community in the most ideal circumstance. So we do in fact learn kinship. We do in fact learn to think of some people as our own and some people as others. But the ethics of remembering others is very deliberate in extending its sense of affiliation and kinship to people who we already think of as somehow different from us. And I like to think of this project as a way of bringing the far and the feared and making them become the near and the dear. And again, if we go back to the level of, of uh, presidential ethics, if we think about Presidents Obama and Clinton and Biden, I think this is their model of ethical memory, remembering others. It's explicit in the calls for diversity, inclusion, multiculturalism, representation, and so on. It's very heartwarming for those of us who believe in this model, but there's a wrinkle because somehow it's still possible to believe in this ethical model of remembering others and yet wage war. That is one of the paradoxical features of democratic presidencies, that they project a rhetoric of inclusion domestically and yet still continue to fire off drone strikes and authorized bomb strikes and all the rest. It's a militarized multiculturalism that characterizes the United States today. In the more optimistic sense though, I think that if it's possible to hate those you've never met, then it's also possible to love those you've never met as well. And that's what drives the ethics of remembering others. So that is a model that is very common in literature. 
And the way that it's often expressed is around this idea of humanity. Like you're human, I'm human, we're all human. Everything's, everything is wonderful. And the expectation, if you are an other, as I have been feeling myself for much of my life, the expectation for those of us who are others, when we speak to people at the center, the people who own power, who own the means of representation and production, the expectation is often that we will prove our humanity since we have always been cast as the other, the far and the feared. And that's a temptation that's extended to those cast as minorities, racial minorities, sexual minorities, any kind of minority you can imagine in relationship to the powerful. And my stance is that we should not do that. We whose humanity has been put into question should not need to prove our humanity. And people who can take their humanity for granted should not expect others to prove their humanity to them. That's a very problematic position to pe put people in. And that's what I wanted to do in my own work in Nothing Ever Dies, where I elaborate upon all these ethical memory uh, issues, and then also in the sympathizer and in the committed, where I try to put into action at the level of a novel and art, this dynamic of not wanting to prove humanity. I think improving humanity oftentimes will make other people feel comfortable with us. And by rejecting the need to prove humanity, we might make people uncomfortable, people who are not familiar with us might feel quite not sure what to do. And I think that's what happened with The Sympathizer, for example. I, in that novel, uh, I, I set out to offend everybody and judging from my hate mail, I, I succeeded. And if you heard my talk yesterday and uh, you know, in the part of this talk today, you, you, it might be kind of clear why there are some Americans out there who would be offended by some of the things I have to say. But a lot of Vietnamese people are offended too. Uh, both, you know, both victorious Vietnamese, communist Vietnamese, and also the anti-communist Vietnamese here in the United States. And you might want to, uh, you might wonder why, why are they offended? Well, I think they are offended because whatever side of the of the of the war they fell in, they want to believe only in their own humanity. I think that's a very normal impulse, it's not unique to the Vietnamese people. I think Americans also want to believe only in their own humanity as well. So they want, they want to believe only in their own humanity, but this is a mistake. It's an ethical mistake with serious consequences. And I think the reason why it's a mistake is we not only should not believe only in our own humanity, we shouldn't need to prove our humanity because we're already human. Trying to prove our humanity is in fact a sign of our inferiority. The majority gets to take its humanity for granted. So why and what do we who are cast as minorities or as others in whatever circumstance, why and what do we need to prove? And I can't help but think that those of us who agree to proving our humanity are agreeing with the project of colonization. And I mentioned briefly yesterday that I would talk about this, but you know, Europe became the Europe that we know now by colonizing much of the world for 500 years, a project that the United States and you know, obviously participated in as well. And the justification for this was around humanity. I mean, Europeans did not justify colonization by saying, you know, we just want to go in there and rape and pillage and steal everything. They went in to other countries proclaiming their humanity and characterizing everyone else that they encountered as less than human. And the irony of this project of humanity was to allow Europeans to engage in all kinds of inhuman behavior. So when Europeans say civilizing mission and Americans say manifest destiny, the colonized sometimes hear conquest, genocide, slavery, and war. And what this means is that we are human and inhuman at the same time. It's not as if the European colonizers are only inhuman 
or only human as they would have liked to see themselves, but they were both. And so are we all. And so when Vietnamese people in the face of war, conflict, and all these terrifying things that happened during that time, when they insist that they're only human, they're in fact denying the inhumanity that is inevitably a part of our humanity. The trickiness, the tricky thing here is that eventually the colonizer does get to a point where he, she, or they claim both their humanity and their inhumanity. And I'll give you one example of this is an example I mentioned yesterday, the movie Apocalypse Now, a movie that caused me a lot of, a lot of trouble. I, mean, I actually really admire that movie because it does exactly this. It doesn't deny that Americans committed atrocities in Vietnam. In fact, it foregrounds the atrocities that Americans committed in Vietnam. And by doing so, it puts Americans at the center of that movie, but also by implication at the center of the story of the war in Vietnam. So on the one hand, Americans got themselves into Vietnam proclaiming humanity, that they were gonna go in there and save Vietnamese people and give them freedom and democracy. And then when things went wrong, Americans then acknowledged that they committed atrocities. But the effect, whether it's claiming humanity or claiming inhumanity, is to keep putting Americans at the center of their own story. Again, a very human impulse, but because of American global power and soft power, Americans putting themselves at the center of their own story is Americans putting themselves at the center of the story of the war in Vietnam, which gets projected all over the world, it becomes a global story. So I felt that our challenge as Vietnamese people, and specifically my challenge as a writer who wanted to write about this history, was to reject this need to prove humanity and to insist only on humanity for Vietnamese people, because being human only is a trap. It's a form of marginalization because people who are only human might be endearing in some ways, but they're also only angels. They're only victims. And I don't know how many of you want to watch stories or read stories about angels and victims. Generally, I don't because they tend to be kind of uninteresting. So to claim full humanity is to acknowledge inhumanity and by doing so is to be able to put ourselves at the center of our story. That's what Coppola did in Apocalypse Now, and that's the project behind the sympathizer and the committed, not to apologize, not to claim humanity, not to prove humanity, but to be as inhuman and as human as the protagonists of movies like Coppola's and really the protagonists of so much of American culture and literature. And this is what I call then the ethics of recognition, the final stage of memory, where we can finally recognize both our humanity and inhumanity, and the humanity and inhumanity of our enemies and our opponents. It's a, it's a kind of complexity that I think is obviously very useful for art, but also, of course, for politics as well. So I finished The Sympathizer. Who else was there left to offend? The French. So that's what The Committed does, the sequel, uh, set in early 1980s. And, and of course, the French colonized Vietnam. And the United States came in in, 19, in the 1940s and 1950s and took over from the French. So the French civilizing mission simply became readapted into the mission of American exceptionalism. And these novels and my work in general is designed to, to contest the civilizing mission of American exceptionalism. Uh, that's why I think of my work as not being just about the war in Vietnam, not just about Vietnamese or Asian Americans, and not even just about trying to become a part of global literature or world literature. Uh, it'd be great if that happened, but I think of my work as trying to perform an anti-colonial function and hopefully also a decolonizing function as well, because I think that's our task. Those of us who live in uh, colonizing countries like the United States, that if we want liberation and justice, emancipation, all these things that are, that, are, that are crucial, that we have to think about these projects as part of decolonization, a project that's going to take a very long time, given that it took centuries of colonization to lead up to the societies, the society of inequality that we have now. So in the face of what I'm saying, 
I think that there is an unethical response that I've heard quite often. And that unethical response is an attempt to deny the inhumanity that is a part of this country. So there are many Americans who have written me, sent me letters, emails, and so on that, that say, love it or leave it. And I think obviously the message behind that is we only want to think about the humanity of Americans, one version of the American story. We don't want to think about the complexities of humanity and inhumanity at the same time. And I think denying that complexity is unethical. And I think that the ethical response to the very complicated history of this country and its many peoples and its um, histories of inequalities, the ethical response is to acknowledge the complexity of this country. That it's a, con it's a country of both beauty and brutality. And that it's a country that is marked by horror, but also eventually by hope. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Viet. I, I think the most difficult part about being on Zoom is that you cannot see us all and uh, see our body language and see us uh, agreeing or um, smiling and, and then certainly thanking you at this time. So uh, we're all out here <laughs> saying thanks. I, I think I'm the voice on the screen, but there are so many others. Um, and I have many questions, but I really will just ask one and then we'll bring in others. Um, and it's in some ways it's it's a general question, but I I wonder in your narrator in in your own voice, um, I hear such a struggle with conscience, and I hear so such a conscientious um, voice, and I, I just wonder if you might say a little about um, your own understanding of conscience or where that comes from, either for your. Uh, narrator for yourself, or maybe by extension to all of us who are trying to be, um, you know, fully engaged human beings. Well, you know, yesterday we had a conversation with Boo uh, about um, religion, Catholicism and Christianity, and I talked a little bit about uh, how I've been, I was raised in a very devout Catholic household and uh, raised in a very devout Catholic Vietnamese community and had a very Catholic education with the Jesuits. And I think that 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 is probably where my conscience mm -hmm. comes from. Um, we, you know, we all know I think the the um, ethical and moral teachings that I'm referring to here. But uh, as I, I think as I mentioned yesterday, I don't believe in the institution of the Catholic Church. Um, I think what we see there is a, you know wonderful ideals that have been uh, <laughs> corrupted. Maybe I'll offend people by saying that, but. And this is this is not unique to to Catholicism or to any other religion. You know, my 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 cynical voice tells me that uh, anything beautiful and idealistic that human beings have come up with, they've also corrupted as well once they put those ideals into an institution. That's what's happened with religion. Um, but the ideals are still powerful, you know. And the the stories that I absorbed growing up uh, stayed with me about what kind of ethical and moral vision is necessary for a just society. Um, you know, one in which, you know, we need people who are willing to speak out and to speak up particularly against the corrupt authorities, uh, including our, our spiritual and uh, moral leaders. And then this was compounded by watching what my parents went through. And I'm grateful that my parents were not hypocrites, that they that they both told me these, these, these Catholic tenets and they lived them as well. But then I also saw them uh, suffering um, as refugee shopkeepers, working really hard. And I had to, and I knew that we were here in this country living this existence because of a war that was waged over which we had no control. So I think it was a matter, this development of conscience was a matter of connecting all of these different kinds of dots um, that if one is to believe, as Jesuits do, that one should be a man for others, and I went to an all-boys Jesuit high school, then we should be for all kinds of others, not just our own kind of other. And by that, I mean 
I think when I when I spoke spoke about Vietnamese refugees who said we're the good refugees, they're the bad refugees, I think what they're what I'm describing is a very human process by which we obviously do not like to be mistreated. And we don't like people who are who are related to to be mistreated, and we'll call out for justice. But then when we see other people being mistreated, we may not extend that same sense of outrage and passion to them. And that I think is a serious failure. Um, and so, you know, I, I really do believe that if we if we believe in in a world of justice for others, it's a world of justice for all others. And so. Once you embark on that perspective, then everything becomes linked. So the project of justice never stops. And we should always be looking for where our own political, moral, ethical blind spots happen to be. And that, again, the final thing here is, this is why I think the, bringing up the question of colonization is so important. Because if we were to think about all of the various kinds of many injustices and inequalities we have in our society from, you know, different kinds of racism directed at, directed at different kinds of people, to police violence, to you know, prisons and so on. We could try to think of each of these things as isolated problems. And if we were to think in that way, we're never actually going to solve them. But if we think of them as being connected, as being networked, as being descended as part of this complex genealogy that in my mind at least, goes back several hundred years to the project of colonization that made this country and other countries, then I think we can see that racism, police violence, prisons, you know, unequal education, these kinds of things, they are all outcomes of this originary moment of violence and conquest, which, are, which is still shaping our present. And that, that to me is a, is a project of, of conscience and a constant expansion of our sense of being able to identify with others who may not seem to be like us on the surface, but who are actually in fact historically connected to us. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I want to invite others into the conversation as well, although I'm not as comfortable with the use of the word other. Let's invite friends into this conversation. Um, Sharon Welch is here with us. And Sharon, let's invite you in. Some of you will remember Sharon as our uh, 2016, I believe, fall lecturer. Uh, so she's a dear friend uh, coming to us from Meadville Lombard Theological School in Chicago. And also our friend, uh, Professor Mari Crabtree from the Car College of Charleston uh, here in town in the African American Studies Department. So, um, friends, let me uh, toss it to you for some questions as well. Welcome. Um, do you know? Do you have someone you want to go first? <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't doesn't matter. So, Mari, how about how about you first? Sure. Um, so uh, thank you for both of your, your talks yesterday and today. And um, as someone who studies um, the African-American experience, um, I think a lot about the work of writers in the African-American tradition and witnessing. So, you know, James Baldwin described himself as a witness, right? He was a witness to the struggle for liberation for Black people, right? He was a witness to the beauty and the grace of Black people, um, he was also a witness to the most horrific elements of white supremacy inflicted upon black people. Um, and even though he was, you know, with civil rights leaders, um, often on the front lines, you know, on, at, you know at, well, the, at the marches, right, giving speeches, he always understood himself to be a witness rather than like, like an activist, so a witness to the movement. And earlier this week, I got to see a lecture that Jasmine Ward gave at Princeton. And she also invoked this idea of witnessing. Um, and in particular, in her case, she was talking about uh, a, a, like a heart-wrenching essay she wrote about the death of her husband last year, um, as well as a book that she published a while back called Men We Reap, which is about the deaths of several young black men, including her brother who were really close to her. And she described what she did as witnessing. She said something along the lines of, um, you know, they went through so much and the least I could do was bear witness to what, who they were, you know? Um, so I wonder what you think of your role, of your position, right? As someone who is a novelist, but also a scholar, but also a public intellectual, also an educator um, in relation to these movements for decolonization. Um, and I wondered if you would adopt a similar kind of language of witnessing 
to talk about your role and your position, um, similar to what uh, Ward and Baldwin use, or if there's another framing that you prefer. Well, thank you for that. I, and I think that uh, that being a witness certainly does encompass some of the things that writers are probably best at doing. Um, and when I talk about you know what I saw in the Vietnamese refugee community, what I saw in my own family, that is a form of witnessing. Uh, and of course, what a writer does is not simply to witness, but to write, to to put that witnessing down onto paper and to, to you know make stories out of them. And uh, that certainly would define part of what it is that that I do. And I think that that is crucial because the societies in which we in which we live don't want the witnessing to take place, right? Uh, witnessing, as we saw with the George Floyd murder, witnessing was crucial in the revelation of what it is that black people had experienced many, many times over and over again in so many different ways. But, you know, that black people had such a hard time persuading non-black people to believe in until they had um, this eyewitness testimony that was available. So there's a, there's a way in which that is really, really crucial. And of course, when it comes to the war in Vietnam, there's so many things that were witnessed by people that have never made it into stories, into movies, into historical accounts and so on. And the more powerful are still the ones who have a greater capacity to take what they've seen and turn it into something that other people have to see as well. So when I think about my work in that way, I also think that there's other things besides witnessing that I feel like I should be obligated to do. Um, you know, when I was in college, I was also an activist doing things like marches, protests, getting arrested, this kind of thing. And I think that for me, there was always a sense of, uh, you know, some, some, some inadequacy around witnessing, like, is that all we can do? And I don't want to dismiss the work of writers at all, um, me being a writer myself, but I, but I feel constantly conflicted that maybe we should be doing more than witnessing as well, even though witnessing itself is incredibly important. And the power of a, of a great novel or of a great uh, essay is tremendous in terms of what it can do in reaching out to people. But nevertheless, I feel this, this sense of guilt um, around not doing enough and that probably has something to do with the previous answer where we think about, you know, Jesus was not just a witness, but he went out there into the temple and he overturned the, the, the tables and so on, all, all that kind of stuff. Action, physical action, leadership is also important. So it's always a very tricky issue for me to try to figure out for myself um, how much is enough in terms of doing things outside of the writing. So that's why I think for me, the writing is not ultimately only a form of witnessing, although it is that, but there are parts of the writing which are also meant to be provocation. Like that would be the equivalent of going and this physically disrupting something is the kind of provocation that writing can do, not only to bear witness, but to provoke people. And that's what I meant when I said that sympathizer was defined, designed to offend people. It wasn't just designed to bear witness to the sufferings of Vietnamese people of whatever background, it was designed to deliberately um, antagonize people who I thought had become too settled in their memory of history, whether those were Vietnamese people or Americans. So I think provocation is something that, that I still think is an, of, a, of as an important task for writers when they're faced with injustice. Thank you. Mm. Um, Professor Nguyen, I'd like to, to build on that and, and, and do it in a way by um, quoting you from your book, one of the things that I found so powerful. And you're talking about using our power. And I think it's how we use our power, both as witness, as we use our power both to dismantle systems of injustice, as we use our power to try to create more just, practices and in institutions and two sentences really stood out to me where you said our use of power must be done with the full awareness of our own humanity and inhumanity our capacity for both good and bad and you talk about the territories of for powerful memory the low ground forces us to confront our persistent humanity the high ground reminds us of our potential for humanity and one of the things that I'd like to ask you to share with us more is how you learned how to hold these things together. Because I know from me growing up where um, I was a Marxist, 
you know, was opposed to the war in Vietnam. And it was very powerful when I read Michel Foucault, who you quote in the book. And he was saying that those of us who are, who are Marxist, we can't just disregard the Gulag archipelago and suppression of political dissent. What was it about our sense of the dictatorship of the pro proletariat that we then became agents of such oppression? You know, we can't just blame that on someone else. Um, and yet it seems that there's an awareness of our potential for inhumanity that isn't the kind of um, kind of giving up on it or denouncing it that goes with many Christian understandings of original sin. And where I found a very different understanding of balancing humanity and inhumanity. And I, I'm wondering if, if these are traditions that you've worked with as well. And if not, um, I would love to know what happened when, when you do. Is for me, I've learned so much about a different way of acknowledging both of those. Um, from the 15 years I spent teaching with Carolee Sanchez, who's from Laguna Pueblo, and reading the work of Leslie Marmon Silco, also from the, Les the Laguna Pueblo, and the writings of Robin Wall Kimmer, who's from the Potawatomi Nation. And, and one of the things I learned early on from Carolee Sanchez is that she said, there's this fallacy that Native Americans are better at taking care of the natural earth somehow intrinsically. And she said, there could be nothing further from the truth. That we're better at it because we remember how horrible we've been at it. We remember the way we overgrazed and overhunted and the way we damaged the earth. And we have rituals because we know that evil in us, that inhumanity never goes away. And so we have to have rituals to check it. Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about um, the way in the, the Potawatomi people, there's a sense of the Wendigo, this sense that we can become so focused on belonging and especially times of scarcity. We want more and more and more and more and just our own needs and we would take pleasure of taking away from other people. And she says, with, and what's amazing about the Potawatomi, they don't see that just in you know, white people and Europeans, they see that as a tendency in themselves. And again, the kind of, we respect, we know we need each other to check that as well as to um, nurture our best. And so my question is, how did you come to this complex both and um, honesty, healing, hope, recognition of our persistent inhumanity and our potential for a more expansive humanity? Thank you, that was a beautiful question. Um, I think partly through a kind of cynicism, you know, like part of the literature that I like to read is cynical literature that, that says, hey, you know, there are all these beautiful human ideals out there that, that lead us into you know, creating these institutions, for example, or doing things like fighting wars which are conducted with all this and wars and revolutions, which are conducted with all of these amazing lofty kinds of ideas and rhetoric. And then look what happens. I mean, inevitably, they, these, these, these idealistic endeavors descend into bloodshed and corruption and, and murder and all kinds of terrible things. So that, 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 that perspective already exists in our artists. And I think it's really, really valuable that we have these people who are willing to not just be the witnesses, but also be the provo provocateurs. So I, I respond very strongly to that kind of aesthetic tradition. And that aesthetic tradition is, is not easily reconciled with ideology. And so this is the interesting conundrum for any artist who would like to think of herself, himself, themselves as being politically engaged. And that, that reality is that, you know, artists are not the same as politicians and, and, and revolutionaries and, and activists oftentimes if you're on the political front, you're fighting, you know, uh, you, you are enacting an ideology and trying to, to realize it. And you are just as susceptible as in the examples you, you brought up with, with, indi with indigenous peoples, you are just as susceptible to blindness, blind spots and failures and so on based on the very thing, the very set of beliefs that motivate you. And so the artist has to, I think, even when they're being witnesses and they're being provocateurs or even participants in political movements, they have to be aware of this and have be ready actually to turn against their own movements once their movements are successful and become the institution because inevitably the institution will get corrupt. And then for me personally, I felt that I, had, I in looking at my own history coming out of, the, coming out of Vietnam, and like you, you know, somehow intuitively, in my case, turning towards a leftist tradition, I had to reconcile that political orientation with what happened in Vietnam, which is that, again, 
both sides, both the anti-communists and the, anti and the communists committed atrocities. And the communists were you know, fairly brutal about the things that they did in the name of noble ideals, liberating the country, unifying it and so on, throwing off colonialism. They committed murders and massacres and all the rest of these kinds of things. And in the aftermath, they built re-education camps and threw in everybody who disagreed with them in there. And these things are wrong. <laughs> I don't think these things are justified in any way, no matter the, what, kind of, what kind of lofty ideals that you're using. And so I, I had to sort of try to think about how to reconcile my own sense of political idealism with the understanding that here were all these other political idealists who had, who had to, or felt they had to, do these terrible things to make their revolution come true. Um, and even to continue doing these things after the revolution had been won. And so in school, of course, I was reading um, people like France Fanon um, and you know, his arguments that violence is necessary for, for decolonization in the wretched of the earth. And again, I was trying to reconcile the theory that he was espousing in the philosophy with this question, well, what would that mean if you actually enacted that? And of course we did see what that meant in Algeria when that was enacted and we see it in Vietnam. And so I think that's, that, that, that is my explanation for, for, for you, know, you know, getting to this answer about an ethics of, of inhumanity and of recognition, uh, which means that we should be forever skeptical of power and ideology. Again, not just the power and ideology of those people we oppose, but the power and ideology that we ourselves have and are trying to, to reach, because we shouldn't believe ourselves to be beyond the inevitability of human corruption. And so uh, it's really in the novel, The Committed, that I, that I wrestle with these things because um, the idea of being a committed writer has always appealed to me, as I think seems, it's probably fairly obvious by now. And yet there's a danger in commitment that the, the really committed are not capable of seeing where they could be wrong. And that makes them both very, you know, very powerful, but also potentially extremely dangerous people. And commitment taken to the real extreme becomes a kind of insanity. And so in the committed, that's, that's, that's what I take on. You know, for example, if, you, if we look at what happened in Southeast Asia, it, what happened in, in Vietnam was not even the worst by any measure. What happened in Cambodia right next door was was, was commitment taken to the insane extreme? And I'll just point to the work of Riti Pan, the Cambodian filmmaker and, and writer who I think is the greatest witness we have to the Cambodian genocide. Um, you would expect, and he was a survivor of the genocide, and you would expect someone like him who lost most of his family to the Khmer Rouge to simply condemn the Khmer Rouge. But instead what he says in his film, The Missing Picture and his book, The Elimination, which I, both of which I highly recommend, you know, when he looks at one of these Khmer Rouge cadres, the man who was in charge of a prison camp that tortured and killed 17,000 people, he says, this man, Doik, he's not inhuman. He's all human. He is man. And Cambodia belongs at the center of human history because of what happened during the Khmer Rouge genocide. So not because of all the beautiful things that the Khmer people did, but because of the inhuman things that happened under the Khmer Rouge revolution. That, Ritipan says, is humanity, is the universality of French enlightenment thinking crossed with communism, crossed with whatever was native to Cambodia. That's what happened. That's what happened. You know, and, and there's no denying both the inhumanity and the humanity of this at the same time. Uh, so that's a really horrible, horrible, you know, really powerful and horrible truth that I think Ritipan came up with and that with one, one with which I fully agree. Thank you for that. Um, I'd, I'd like to raise up, if possible, I know our time is, is short, um, a couple of questions that came in, maybe we could try to get to, let's see how, how we do on time. Um, one comes from Sue Turner and it starts uh, with something from Nothing Ever Dies. And she uses the quote, um, being a victim is a masked power that compels guilt on the part of the rescuer or the one who feels pity, but is also a trick played on the victim for the victim's supposed benefit. To see oneself only as a victim simplifies power and excuses the victim from the obligations of ethical behavior 
in politics, warfare, love, and art. And her question, um, she says, Fox News and the right-wing media have been very effective at convincing white men and women, especially white men, that they are victims of opportunities lost unjustly uh, to others and that their culture has been somehow canceled. Uh, she'd like to know what your reaction might be to the majority of power holders convincing themselves that they're victims and how that affects power relationships in the US. Well, I, I think that's true. I mean, uh, the way that Sue has depicted it, um, it's amazing how even the most powerful like to think of themselves as victims. I don't know, if, I don't know. I mean, part of it I'm sure is, is uh, strategic and cynical political calculation, but part of it I think is probably, probably genuine, um, a genuine emotional sense of victimization. Uh, because for example, if I were to put myself in that situation of, of uh, a particular kind of white person that she's describing, um, then I could perhaps see myself as being someone who's lost things. I've lost this privilege or that prerogative or, or this entitlement and so on. And I, I don't see that as a form of justice, but I, just, I would see that as a form of, of me being victimized. Um, and that is a... A, a state that is that allows you both to struggle for power, as I think we're, we're witnessing, but also to deny one's power as well. And it's not that we're seeing this somehow happening completely anew at this moment. It's happened before. Um, and broadly speaking, across all of American culture, not just the particular um, subset that Sue is describing. But for example, 9-11, at that moment, if you, if you remember back, the overwhelming sense of, I think, response by Americans was that they were being victimized. They were the victims of this assault. And of course they were in one sense. But I remember Barbara Kingsolver, the writer, coming out very courageously, I think, almost immediately writing an essay saying, yes, the bombing is terrifying and terrible and 3,000 plus people died. But the United States does this on a very regular basis to other countries. And we never recognized that, uh, most of us never recognized that happening. And she was obviously <laughs> widely castigated for contesting the widespread sense of victimization that Americans felt. Um, so I think the only point here is simply to recognize that victimization is a powerful form of, of political mobilization that, that, uh, that, that, is, that, that is not unique to one particular kind of ideology. Um, and that's something that is that it is something that we need to, you know, we need to obviously recognize when it genuinely happens, but we also have to recognize how it's such so tempting for us to think of ourselves as victims in that way. Um, both people who belong to a majority and people who belong to a minority as well, because in, for a majority, it allows them to try to hold on to their power through the sense of victimization. And for minorities, I think Victimization is really troubling because on the one hand, it allows us to speak about genuine atrocities that might have happened to us. But on the other hand, it, it, there is a sense in which, you know, the, the general critique of victimization and, 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 the, and that it renders us, renders us feeling powerless is also true. And it, it obscures how even among the subordinated populations, I don't know of anybody who's very, very few instances I can think of where people are completely powerless. What we see in subordinated populations is unfortunately that the victimized, the ones who are marginalized with whatever power they still have left can use that power to victimize others right next to them. And that is something that is obviously, you know, one of the unpalatable consequences of victimization and goes back to my earlier argument. It doesn't make us more human. It doesn't make us better people. It can make us worse people as well. So we have to guard ourselves against that, no matter what situation we find ourselves in. Well, uh, thank you. I, I, and I know we are short on time, a little over time. One person had, uh, our friend Bill Epps had tried to ask a question last evening and we ran out of time. And uh, I'd hate to do that again. If his question, if we have time for just one final question, he had asked, um, when you were struggling with Apocalypse Now, um, how did Conrad uh, and Heart of Darkness perhaps help you? Or there may be uh, anti-colonial writers that you would like to reference, but it's, I think, a question about that 
um, the kind of dialogue between artists, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there's a very famous uh, Chino Achebe response, and he, Chino Achebe wrote uh, Things Fall Apart, and um, he had an essay contesting Conrad and his depiction of Black mm -hmm. Africans. Uh, and I think that, that it's not an exchange, but that novel and then that response, right. I think is so relevant today still. I mean, it, it very much helps to define, you know, so many responses by formerly colonized peoples or minoritized peoples or whatever, uh, who are responding to artistic depictions in which people who look like them are, uh, marginalized and even dehumanized, even in a project that is against colonization, as I think Heart of Darkness is. And so Apocalypse Now and Heart of Darkness do many of the same functions, being critical of dominant power, whether it's colonization or, or war, and yet again, putting um, the colonizers experience at the center in marginalizing and distorting the, the lives, the histories, the perspectives of the colonized. And so for someone like me, that's why my relationship to uh, Apocalypse Now is a little bit ambivalent because I will criticize it forever, but I also will say, I think it's a pretty good movie. You know, I think that it, it aesthetically does some amazing things and likewise with Heart of Darkness, but I'm not in a position to tell Achebe he's wrong about Heart of Darkness. I'm just simply saying that that dynamic is a very legitimate one and one that we need to pay attention to, but it doesn't condition how everybody responds to a text like Heart of Darkness or Apocalypse Now and that it's possible to both recognize a, an aesthetic work's great accomplishment and yet also recognize how part of that greatness comes directly from the contradiction of subjugation that it's depicting. And so my revenge on Apocalypse Now is not simply to satirize it as I did in The Sympathizer, but to try to do what, it's, what it itself is doing, but you know, against, the, against, in this case, the United States in The Sympathizer and against France in the committed, but the sweetest revenge that the colonized can do, well, I guess there might, there might be more than one form of sweet revenge. One form of sweet revenge is to tell our stories, but the other form of sweet revenge is to take it to the man uh, in our own work and to give the colonizer a taste of their own representational medicine. Well, amen. Since, <laughs> since I'm a pastor, I can say that. Um, I wanted to uh, just thank everyone for joining us for this conversation. Uh, Mari uh, Crabtree, Sharon Welch, thank you for being with us. Uh, and special thanks to Professor Viet Thanh Nguyen uh, for helping us begin the work of decolonizing our imaginations and uh, developing an ethic that follows from it. It's, um, it's been a delight to be with you and also a wonderful challenge. So thank you for your time with us and thank you everyone uh, for such a good evening. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Sharon, for engaging with, yeah. with me. And thank you, Jeremy, for, for having me here with the, uh, the congregation. And thanks to all of you for listening today and yesterday. Yeah.